better than that, guys. <laughs> said to me, Jimmy, you know all the city agencies. You're going to be great here. I did know a lot, and it did help me. Because when you're a city councilman, let me tell you something. And um, it's hard to describe. You're in the district day and night. You know, my phone goes off Saturdays and Sundays, and all day I'm in the And if I'm not at city hall, I'm in the office. And you want to get people services. You want to clean up the garbage. You want to make sure people get action on their complaints. And that's your job. But then I'm running back and forth to City Hall. And what kills me about that more than anything else is that it takes me an hour and a half almost each way. Mm. I feel I waste three hours a day because I'm, I'm on the train. Or I'm in a car on the FDR drive. And I do take the train most times because I've given up on driving on the FDR drive. The parking lot. Right. So when you're on the train, and you can't talk on the phone, even though you can still text, and I can still go through my emails. So I'm on the train every day, and I meet a lot of people. But the bottom line is this. When you're a city councilman also, you have to be involved in legislation. We have to legislate. We have oversight over all city agencies. And we adopt the budget in the city of New York. And I'm on the budget negotiating team. I'm in the leadership of the city council. And many of you know me for what I do, getting the garbage cleaned up and the graffiti removed. But I have to tell you what, something you may not know. And I'm very proud. Not proud of myself. I have to tell you something. I'm proud of my staff. I hired the best damn people I could find in 12 years. If it wasn't for them, I could not do what we did. Not do it. And these are people who come into my office and they yell at me constantly. Jimmy, you're crazy. Jimmy, you can't do this. Jimmy, we're not doing this right. But you want people like that. I don't want people to tell me I'm wonderful. I need people to disagree with me who have the capacity to make suggestions and make sure that maybe if I'm 80% right, they have to bring me to 90%. Or if I'm totally wrong, they got to bring me back to 360. 
So we have passed important laws, and I thank my staff for running the office, helping me so much. They've been fantastic through the years. People don't know this is what we've done. First of all, when I ran in 2005, I said that if it was the last thing I do, I was going to, I was going to address out of context overdevelopment in this community. And we downzoned every neighborhood in this district between the time I was here at Board 10, and then we continued it by law when I went to the city council. Only four months ago, five months ago, because the <coughs> former mayor Bloomberg opposed my bill, we finally have a bill that says if you owe the city of New York money, and you want to go ahead, and you're a developer, and you want to go ahead and you want to build more, well, you're not going to build more until you pay the city of New York the money you owe them. Mm -hmm. And that was my bill. We are owed $800 million in building department fines that we cannot collect. And I'll be damned if these same people were going to go ahead and build these out of context <coughs> developments in our community and think that they were going to do it without legislation protecting us. So when these individuals propose overdevelopment and you're against it, it gives the neighborhood another tool. These people have to pay what they owe or they should not be allowed to build. And now that's law based on my bill. Civil rights, human rights. I found out that if you have an apartment house, and which we knew when I was district manager, if there was a leak, if there was mold, you could go in. And if the landlord says, I'm not doing it, he refuses to do it, then the city of New York is authorized to go and do it. And the city of New York can give the landlord the bill. Mm -hmm. Well, when an elevator broke down, and we had a case on Middletown Road where the elevator broke down, senior citizens are in this high-rise building, senior citizens, people who are handicapped. So when the elevator broke down, the city did not have the same authority. Landlords were able to say, oh, I'm waiting for the insurance payment. I can't fix the elevator yet. Meanwhile, senior citizens, disabled people have to well, climb stop. steps up and down. Yes. They can't make doctor appointments. They can't continue to exist. Mm -hmm. Well, I passed legislation that I introduced myself, and that legislation says that now the city of New York is authorized to fix the damn elevator if the landlord says no, and give the landlord the bill after the elevator is fixed. <laughs> Civil rights and human rights are basic rights. I fight for people. I fight for people. I come from a family that believed in that all my life. When I grew up as a kid, I grew up with a father who was blind. I know what it is for people to be denied basic rights. And I found out that interns who are not paid, who when they work in the private sector, do not, did not have the same rights to file complaints about human rights and civil rights as people who had internships in the public sector or who were paid. So to make it simple, if you're an intern in the private sector and you were not being paid, you had no regress if you experienced discrimination, sexual harassment, or anything of the like. And I introduced a bill which passed the civil, which passed the council, that we now gives those interns redress through city agencies to protect their civil rights and their human rights. I found out that pregnant women did not have the right to ask for simple accommodations when they were expecting. Now, first of all, let me ask about interns. I don't know if you know this, but a lot of students out of college today, they can't get their first job. They use internships as resume boosters. Those internships allow them to network and get their first job. And these people are going to intern and be discriminated against and be harassed. That's why my law was introduced by myself in the past. And I mentioned the Pregnancy Bill of Rights. It's called the Pregnancy Bill of Rights Bill. We have pregnant and expecting, expectant women, many of them work in retail, retail jobs. And when they work in retail jobs, we had employers who would not allow them to sit on a stool, would not allow them a water break, would not allow them basic accommodations. My bill requires that expectant women be treated like human beings in whatever type of job they have, and that they give women the recourse to file complaints
complaints with the city of New York should they feel that their being pregnant is a pretense for their being fired because an employer will not give them basic accommodations. So a legislative record that I think we can be proud of, community record, I mean, really, I mean, I have to, my daughter tells me the other day, I'm driving on the highway, and I said, oh my God, Liz, this grass has to be cut. And she says, Daddy, you have to stop it. You will soon be out of office. You have to stop it. But I will be honest with you, I just drove from my office at 3040 East Tremont Avenue, and I drove here. I saw a homeless person on Westchester Avenue at Westchester Square, and to be honest with you, he did not have pants on. And here again, I pulled my, I still have my <laughs> Although if you think city government moves very quickly, I have to tell you, keep your pants off. <laughs> but what do I do again? It's just, it's just an inclination, or not, what's the word, habit. I pulled my car aside, I pulled the desk over to the 45th, I let them know that we have a homeless person here, this person needs help. I do that all the time, it's force of habit, and really that started with this job. Because on this job, you really have to be all over the place. And when you see things, report them. And I always do. It annoyed me today at Middletown Road train station. I was at Middletown Road train station. The litter basket is full. But the litter basket is not full. It's full of people's household garbage. These small bags you get from Stop and Shop and, you know, the, the white plastic. About 10 of them were in the litter basket. That means people are using the litter basket for their household garbage. Mm -hmm. Wait for the sanitation department to pick up your garbage. Litter baskets are for litter. So these things have always bothered me, and these things are called basic quality of life. So I could go on and on. I did not want to leave office without coming back here because this boy has meant so much to me. I love you all. Uh, I do not represent Co-op City for 12 years. I did represent you for 26 years. But I will tell you something in Co-op City. We had many great issues in Co-op City, but my greatest feeling about Co-op City and my greatest um, feeling of accomplishment is what we call Gibbons Creek Woods. And Gibbons Creek Woods, which is on Co-op City Boulevard and Tillerson Avenue, was going to be developed for massive shopping centers and buildings years ago. And what we did is that um, I had evidence of flora, F-L-O-R-A. That is very, very um, distinct plantings. And I went to the Natural Resources of the Parks Department there, they have an agency on natural resources. And I said, I'd like an inventory done. And we got the inventory done at the time. And um, we got Mayor Giuliani and Deputy Mayor Freya Ryder to back off. And now that is forever wild and that property is forever protected from development because it gives co-op city open space and natural resources that we were able to protect. And um, of course in my own neighborhood, um, well I go back with the Pelham Bay landfill, I don't know if you know the whole story, but I'll tell you quickly and then I'll let you go. Because I know you, I never give a politician the microphone, especially this guy. I don't get off. I don't get off. Uh, I don't know if all of you know the story of the Pelham Bay garbage dump. Um, I, I tell these stories because history is important. Uh, Pelham Bay was a garbage, you, you know, Berry Point was a garbage dump. The city of New York dumped garbage there for years. And then in 1963, they closed Berry Point. They had no more room. So they put the garbage from Berry Point to Pelham Bay. And then in 1977, after we had protests, we closed down the Pelham Bay landfill. Uh, myself, Florence Colucci, Joe Cornetta, Jim Dell, I'll give you the names. We closed it down because we were protesting. Pelham Bay landfill was toxic. We had foul odors in Co-op City and Frog's Neck and Country Club and Pelham Bay. So we closed it down and then we started to do our research. And if you do research without the internet, lots of luck. We're spoiled today. Yes, we are. Oh, we're spoiled. You go try to do research like we did in the 70s without the internet. Well, we researched in our own ways, and I was involved very much in that, and what we did is that we found that the, the Pelham Bay landfill did not have a New York State permit to operate all the years that it operated. They needed a permit under Section 360 of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, and they did not have it. And we reached out to an attorney, and the attorney we reached out to was the late Senator John Calandra. And 
And um, three people, oh, two of whom are not with us today, uh, and myself, as a, oh my God, I think I was 21 years old. We, we went to court, and Senator Klander represented us, and uh, Mayor Koch was ordered to close the garbage dump. So now Mayor Koch comes to us, and Mayor Koch tells the community, okay, we're gonna close Pelham Bay, but I have no place else to put the garbage. Mm. I'm putting it back in Berry Point Park. Mm -hmm. So we now have to fight with Rod's Nick, not to have the garbage dump back that they closed down. The garbage dump that they closed down was still letting out methane gas. So now they want to bring it back, and Mayor Koch would not budge. Our councilman was Mike DeMarco. And Mike DeMarco got into a real big fight with Koch over this. And Koch would not budge. You had to know Mayor Koch. That's how he was. So we figured we lost. And where Home Depot is on Bruckner Boulevard, that was a restaurant uh, called Howard Johnson. And on uh, Wednesday night, you got all the fish fry you want. <laughs> and we used to go there, a group of us, and we used to have coffee after our meetings. We went there one night. And I'll never forget it. There was a lady named, who was on board 10, a lady named Rose Johnson. Oh my gosh, God bless her, she's up there. She ate good. And then she put sweet and low in her home. <laughs> but I can tell you stories. But this is all incidental. I love that to death, though. And we used to have it. Rose Foley used to be with us, Rose Johnson. And we had coffee and we said we'd lost. And I'm driving my car back on Brooklyn Boulevard. And I said, oh no, I can't, I can't fathom this. Something's wrong. And then I slept on it. And I came back the next day and I said, wait a minute. Why did the city, why was the city putting the garbage back in Ferry Point Park? What has changed between 1977 and 1963? Why can't they do it now? And there was one thing. I'll give you a guess. What changed in Toronto's neck between 1963 and 1977? The golf The Bloody Airport. What does garbage attract? Seagulls. I came back to my house. I said, Seagulls will be in the line of the airplane. And we called the Federal Aviation Administration, and the Federal Aviation then told Mayor Koch, did not come and hear you. Mike DeMarco called me and Mike DeMarco said to me, Jimmy, I took hell at City Hall today because of what you did. I said, I don't know why. Why, why Mike? He says, the mayor's putting it in Staten Island. I said, that's Staten Island's worry. <laughs> so, all these things and our involvement over the years has been great. And I, I love you all. And I'm going to be around, like I said, and I want to wish you well. I, I want to say you're very important. You are very important. Understand that each one of you has a responsible position, and each one of you has to understand you has you have to never give up. Where there's a will, there's a relative, but there's also <laughs> where there's a will, there is a way. And I'm going to relinquish. I know we have as our guest one of the finest public officials in the city, and I don't say that because he's here. He's a driver <laughs> and he's known. His reports are fantastic. He is finding waste and inefficiency. And he's, but beyond that, he's a friend. And Scott String is a great person. But I want to thank you all and support each other. Help each other. Don't fight each other. There are too few of us. <laughs> Ain't no room for fighting. You know, I have my colleagues in the city council. I don't agree with them all the time. But you know what? I like them. And when you like them and you're nice, you get a lot of things done. It's called respect. And always respect each other. Thank you very much.